Hello, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for participating in this Metro Vancouver Facebook Live event. Um, my name is Karen England. I am a gardener myself. I'm a practicing landscape architect, and I work as a park planner for Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. I am your host today for this live event um, where we will be sharing sustainable gardening practices and information about the Grow Green Guide, which is a website uh, created by Metro Vancouver and the UBC Botanical Garden to support gardeners. Before we go any further, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that the land that we live on is shared, is the shared ancestral homeland of Coast Salish First Nations. This is a time of year when our thoughts turn to what we are thankful for, and I would like to express my personal gratitude to the Indigenous people that I work with for their example of how to nurture each other and this beautiful and bountiful place. This is our ninth and final installment for the year of our Grow Green live stream series, and we've been exploring garden related topics with guest experts. We've talked about lawn alternatives, uh, trees, native plant gardening, gardening and harvesting, among other topics. All of these videos are available for viewing on Metro Vancouver's Facebook page. So you can at your leisure go back and rewatch or uh, see any that you missed if you just go to Metro Vancouver's Facebook page. I'd like to share the Grow Green Guide website with you now. This is our Grow Green Guide website. Um, it can be found at growgreenguide.ca. It was developed in collaboration with the UBC Botanical Garden. So you know that the information that is provided here is locally appropriate and trustworthy. It has a couple of different tools. It's got a um, design tool that has pre-generated designs for different growing conditions. It has find the right plant tool, which has information about plants that we recommend for this region. And it also has resources. You can see we've got news, garden vocabulary, and gardening tips. Um, the gardening tips are on hot topics. We focus on topics of sustainability and sustainable gardening practice, such as reducing water use and creating habitat for birds and pollinators. Um, there's lots of resources that you can see underneath each of these topics. You can join our mailing list to receive updates about the program and you can even send us your gardening questions. So if you send us a gardening question, uh, staff at UBC Botanical Garden will respond to you. That is a fantastic um, tool right there. Even if you only use the website for that, um, you'd be getting a, a, a great benefit from it. I would now like to introduce our guest speaker for today, who is Carol Christopher. She is a master gardener and a board member at the Society Promoting Environmental Conservation, better known locally as SPEC. Um, I would like to welcome you, Carol. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. We're delighted and to have you. Thank you. Could you I just want to quickly, I, I was going to say, I will just quickly say that both as a master gardener and particularly in terms of my own learning, I found the Grow Green Guide very supportive and have recommended it often, so go green. Well, that's wonderful, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Could you tell us a little bit more about SPEC and the work that you do there? Sure. Well, currently I'm a board member. I've been on the board of SPEC for, I think, 23 years. And SPEC is an organization that's 51 years old, so I've been there nearly half the time of SPEC's existence. I've seen a lot of changes. And, um, but going back to the early years, just quickly I'll say, SPEC has supported uh, sustainable transportation and biking since the beginning, supported energy conservation and reducing pollution since the beginning. Um, we have been doing some other things as time goes on and changes come about. But I think that right now, two of the most uh, significant projects that we're involved in, one of them is teaching kids how to garden at a school garden program where we have gardens in, I think it's 11 different schools now. And uh, we, we affect in the hundreds of children every year. 
with the gardening. Now, it's a little bit unclear what's going to happen this year because of COVID and sustaining it, but I know there's a partnership with Master Gardeners and we are providing, we are ready to provide as soon as the schools are ready to receive us. So that's one of the things that we do that is kind of a flagship program. We also do a lot of work in sustainability, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, around a lot of waste, a lot of work in, in teaching people how to become even more masterful in the way in which they cut their own uh, material consumption and practice sustainable sustainable practices. So yeah, yeah so spec, spec does a lot. I'm on the board and I and I, I wear my spec pin over there because it's my heart organization. <laughs> yeah. That's probably the best thing for me to say. Yeah. It sounds like really important work that you're doing. So. You know, uh, it. I think that it is. It, uh, one of the things that I did last year was to step down as the president of the organization and become the guiding elder. And that's a very interesting role to take on because I think it's so important for elders in our society to reclaim their role as experienced and often very wise people with something to give back. So I'm doing a lot of encouraging and I'm supporting other people to think in terms of be guiding elders in the organizations that you've been a part of. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Um, at this time of year, people are starting to think about doing their fall cleanup for the garden space. And some of the practices that I was taught um, or saw my mother and my grandmother do are in conflict now with sustainable gardening practices. So well, what are your thoughts about this? How do you go about cleaning up your garden for the fall? Yeah, you know, uh, and I've been gardening now for at least 45 years. And so I went through the same change that people have gone through. And I used to like also go out and tear everything out of the garden. And, and uh, that was even before I had a compost. That was in the days when you threw things in the garbage which is almost unthinkable now. But over that time, we've really learned a lot uh, that we, we pay too much attention to what's above the ground and not enough attention to what's below the surface. And so we know now, and I think this learning has been vast in the last 20 years and growing more and more quickly in the last decade, that there is a tremendously complex matrix of, of uh, small microbes and insects and mycorrhizae, which is the, the material out of which um, mushrooms come up, that this is like a tremendous support system beneath the ground. And if we want that support system to keep working for us, we've really got to give them a favor back. And the way to do that is instead of cleaning everything up, which is not good maintenance, it's to return the organic material to the soil, add even more organic material in what in, in the form of, of leaves, for example, and compost, and, and keep that material cycling back into the soil. It feeds the microbes, it, it helps the structure of the soil, it makes a healthy soil and that soil actually <clears throat> can now absorb more carbon. How do you go about adding the soil, the leaves back to the soil? I know I've got some trees growing in my neighborhood that have very large, thick leaves, and it doesn't, they seem to just kind of lie on the ground like a lump, and they never do decompose. Is there something that you can do to help the, the leaves well, get integrated back? The, they will decompose eventually, but there there is. A, you can make a choice. <clears throat> I have a wonderful maple tree and I collect bags and bags and bags, but I also, and I really recommend this for people that don't have access to leaves on their property, but they've got uh, gardens that they want to protect and mulch. If you, if you walk around, you'll see leaves sitting out in people's back alleys <clears throat> and you can grab a bag or two of them. I even do that sometimes just to get 
different leaves. So it isn't always my maple leaves, but a, a mixture of leaves. And I keep a, a, a mulch on the soil pretty much year round. In the summer, it's really to protect from water loss. But in the winter, it provides insulation. And it's also something that the, the microbes in the soil and the living material of the soil is pulling that stuff down all the time. So you don't just put it on once, you can put it on repeatedly. But it's, it's a good idea to start out with a nice thick layer. But you, uh, just before I continue more on the leaves, I'll, I'll go back and I'll say, even the leathery ones will break down, but it's not a bad idea to choose ones that look like they're gonna be a little more inclined. But also what you want during the winter is you want nice fluffy insulation. So those leaves that look like they might not break down might be just fine for your garden because they'll hold the insulation. So um, there's, a, there's a little uh, catchphrase called chop and drop. So rather than taking things out of your garden, I mean, if you look around the things that you can see behind me in my garden, the, uh, hold on just a second. I need to decline an incoming call. Uh -huh. Hey, great. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm sorry about that. We uh, can't quite avoid all of those little interruptions. <laughs> but behind me, you'll see the garden. There's lots of harvesting yet. And many of these things will go over the winter, even if some of their leaves look tattered and torn. So I want to give them lots of protection. And so when I um, am taking down things that are no longer viable, I use, I'm going to just lean over here, mm -hmm. a garden scissor like this, and I chop it, not super fine, it's coarse, but I let it drop to the soil and I include the stalks. And then if I, in some places where I'm doing that, it's not my regular garden beds, but it's things just around where there's a plant that's kind of overgrown or whatever. Once I do that, I can cover that with leaves as well. And that kind of gives it uh, a little more cheerful look. Anyway, that's a really good strategy. Leave the organic material on the soil. Let it stay where it was and, can, and give back to the soil. If you think about it, what's going on in that whole process of plant growth and, and uh, photosynthesis. It's developing carbohydrates, that's carbon. There's a lot of carbon. So you're, you're feeding the soil and the soil will take it back. Would you have to do anything to keep the leaves from blowing away in a storm? Do you cover you them? Know, once, once the rains come along and start to moisten the leaves, they're pretty sturdy. They're pretty sturdy. So if you put them on and they're dry, and like I put leaves on yesterday, um, late in the day when the, when the weather turned. Um, but if I had put them on dry before those 60 to 90 kilometer winds that we had, some of them for sure would have blown away. But they, they settle in pretty quickly and they stay in place. And you can be coming along, you know, with another bag of leaves. <laughs> I store bags. If you don't have them, again, grab them from somebody's uh, backyard, or not their backyard, but their back alley. And Even the gutters out. fill up with leaves at this time That's of year. That's true. You can use those. You yeah. can use those too. Um, yeah. I have also, in the past, when I have pots, raised pots, I have put um, garden mesh over the leaves in the pot to hold them in place. Not for the whole a large garden bed, but just um, maybe at a, in a balcony garden where you're growing in uh, containers, a little bit windier. Yeah, um, so um, I, I, with containers, there's a lot of different things to say about containers. Would you like me to go a little more into sure. containers? Okay, sure, sure. so if you were here now and looked around, you could see that I have probably a dozen containers that I will be doing different things with. Containers that you do not, um, that you don't uh, take out of the winter rains tend to get quite dense and heavy. 
So it is better to not leave your containers just sitting out in the winter rains. So there's a couple of things that you can do. If you have garden space, you can put things into the garden space. You can put them into the ground. If it's a, if it's a perennial, and will come. If it's an annual, well, it's done. Do you understand? <clears throat> For people that might not understand the difference, an annual is something that grows and is done over one growing season. Its entire um, life cycle is complete. That's right. The entire life cycle is complete. And when that's done, that's one of those things that if you have a place where you can keep a pile, you can put the, that on your pile and just let it slowly decompose. That is great material to add to various places in your garden as you go along. So that's number one. With containers that um, where you, you want to keep them in the containers, if there's a way for you to bring it close in under the eaves of a house or to some way protect it from the steady winter rains, then also it may be that what's in that container is a little more exposed to the cold because it's up out of the soil and it's got cold on all four sides uh, as well as the top. So it's, it's going to do better if it's protected. But it's usually better to try to find a sunny location. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got something in my throat that's making me a little hoarse. If you can find a sunnier location, that's good because that'll give it some extra warmth. Now, with balcony plants, you can mulch those the same way that you would mulch the garden. You have to know, is this a plant that's meant to go through the winter? If it's a vegetable, most men, there are vegetables that are perennial, and there are other vegetables that will come back, like kale and collards, and often Swiss chard in, in our climate. But if it's just a, a, a summer broccoli, for example, that plant's done. And so you might as well take it out. But if you have something that you know will go through the winter, you can protect the pot in much the same way that you protect the garden. Put some leaves on it, pile the leaves up, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get pretty good protection. But the other thing that you can do in containers, and you can also do in the garden, and I'll move a little to the side. Can you see behind me the garden that's protected? Yes. Yes. So what I've done there, and I do this with all of my gardens, and I do it with some containers, is I take green maple that looks like this, hang on, and I will get it. <clears throat> it's material that looks like just white cloth and you can, you can see the light through it, but it provides quite a lot of insulation. And if you get that, you can cut it in the right size and just use, um, uh, uh, clothespins to clip it to the side of the pot. It depends a little bit on the pot whether you can make that work, but find a way to anchor it because they will blow away if you don't anchor it. Mm -hmm. But that's another way that you can protect them. It'll also provide a little bit of protection from the rain. If you have the means of bringing something inside and it's a really nasty cold snap and you can manage it, well, okay, bring it inside. But, you know, there's lots of things that are in pots that are way too big to be maneuvering yeah. around and bringing in and out of your house. So I'm happy to answer any other questions, but that's a kind of general look at handling. Put it next to where it's sheltered, cover it, um, mulch it, and in some cases, take the, the what's in the pot out of it and put it in the ground. Right. What about uh, pruning in the fall as another gardening task that um, some people might be considering doing as part of their fall cleanup? Yeah. So pruning is quite complicated, actually. There are little there are little rules. Like um, one of them is if it's if it's a an, a deciduous a leaf bearing tree that drops its leaves. Well, all leaves all trees are leaf bearing, but it drops its leaves. It's deciduous 
then um, then that should be pruned in dormant seasons, but there are exceptions. And if it's an evergreen, it's pruned in March or October. But again, there are exceptions. So and what I thought I would do is to just talk a little bit about most deciduous plants, you can prune um, a little bit. Do you know, every time that you deadhead a plant, you're pruning. That's right. a form of pruning. But when you get to the fall, you want to take out dead tw twigs and dead branches and dead canes, things like that. But it's better to save the heavy or what's called hard pruning until late in the winter or early in the spring. Most people do it around here in the lower mainland in February. February might be a bit early for some places in the valley where it stays colder longer. And certainly in the northern part of the province, you might want to mm -hmm. wait. Winter is, a, is a, it's on a different timing. Yeah. But when you do the, um, uh, in, in the fall, when you do the kind of cleanup of the plant itself, it's good to take off the dead leaves or the leaves that look like they've been a little bit diseased. And by the way, it's probably a good idea if you've got disease not to drop that on the soil, right. but that's good to put in the city compost or in your own compost. Um, yeah, so I think with the most of the pruning, it's best to stick to that Went late winter schedule. Now, here's some really important exceptions. Almost all of the spring blooming shrubs, like magnolias, like rhododendrons, like camellias, like azaleas, like Daphne, um, and 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 I could go on and name others. Those put buds on for the next bloom, either right after they have bloomed or shortly after, or by mid or later summer. You if can you, see the buds on those things now, if you look. It's true, it's true. And if people look and think about it, they would realize if I cut that off, I'm cutting off the bud. Yeah. But if you yeah. don't know that and you're a new gardener, then you may be a little bit uh, confused and think, oh, well, it's time to prune. But if you do that pruning on those kinds of plants, you lose the bloom for the next year. They'll come sure back. Enough, every spring, there's someone phoning into the garden, a garden show on, on the radio, asking yeah. why their plant, their spring flower and plant isn't blooming. And it's usually because they pruned it at the wrong time of year. Yeah. So you can see a bud and you know, don't, don't prune that off. Exactly. Exactly. And um, one of the, one of the plants that I think really helps to frame this idea that you prune for different purposes at different times are roses because a rose, you can harvest the, bud, the, the, uh, the flower or the bud um, or take, a, take off a dead rose head uh, and you take it back down the stem to a stronger thing. You're doing that all the time during the growing season, okay? Then in the fall, you take out the dead canes and you might want to take out anything that's grown wild. And certainly if you are using, if you have a rose, that's a, that has a graft and you have a sucker, you may think you don't know what a sucker is, but it looks so different from other canes. You'll go, what is that? And you'll say, that's probably a sucker. And that has to come out immediately as soon as you see it. And so that could be any time, June, July, August. But then um, you wait to do the hard pruning in February. In fact, there's a, there's a little formula, you, you prune the rose when the forsythia blooms. And that's true no matter where you are, because the forsythia is really alert to what's happening in the weather. It doesn't bloom until the temperature, until the soil temperature reaches a certain, and then it's safe for the rose. Now, I could say that, and there are always things that happen. And it's possible that the that it it might you might get a cold snap that would still affect. But in general, you can trust that formula. Yeah. We've got a couple of questions coming in from um, sure. Facebook. Can I ask the question? 
Uh, what is the name of the white material that you mentioned and where can you buy it? Yeah, it's Remay, Remay cloth, and it can be bought at most garden centers. I also want to, I'll point out to you a really great source of gardening things, which is West Coast Seeds. That's where I get my Remay because I can get big bolts of Remay and I use a fair amount of it. I, I use it for protection. Mm. Like even this summer, you know, we went from cold and cool and damp to quite hot quite suddenly. I think it was in July. And the recommendation is that you really should with tender leaves like Swiss chard, you should cover them mm. and give them a chance to acclimate to this new warm weather. So I'm, I've got this stuff handy at many times during the year. So I've never thought about covering things from heat before. Yeah, especially when it goes quickly from cool to hot, yeah. then it, not every plant, but many plants or some plants <clears throat> will, they'll, they'll get a little sunburn. You'll actually see the leaves looking like they've been yeah. burned, scalded. Mm -hmm. Another question from online. Someone's asking if they bring a plant inside, is artificial light okay? They're thinking about leaving a plant in their garage. Uh, well, in, if you bring a plant inside like a garage, most garages don't have very much light. What I think would, first of all, I think often you can bring the plant in on a really cold night and set it back out the next day. If you don't want to be shifting it, it does need light. And just a, 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 a regular bulb in the ceiling isn't going to do it. But you mm -hmm. can get grow lights. The grow lights are a little bit on the expensive side, but if it's a plant that's worth tugging back and forth and all of the, the other things that we do to save the plants, it might be worth spending the money to set up a situation where you have a good grow light. You know, mm -hmm. But it must have light. Mm -hmm. Could you put grow lights in your garage and leave them on? Yeah, you could. You could put grow lights in your garage. I have a little greenhouse on the, it's an odd place for it. It's on the second floor porch that I, I enclose a little balcony on the second floor. And I have grow lights going there uh, from probably February until October because I'm always new seedlings or growing basil. I grow the basil in the greenhouse because it's much warmer in there. And we've had a very cool year this year, but even on a warm year, there are certain crops that don't like to shiver outside. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely. I would, uh, in an offline conversation, I'd like to find out from you what you put in your greenhouse, but I'll save that for a person. That's my personal interest. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts about fertilizing in the fall? No, um, if you think about it, that which I said we should do, the chop and drop and add the leaves and uh, sometimes extra compost, that's fertilizer. That is feeding. It's not the, the fertilizer that comes in the bags and the boxes that emphasizes NPK, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But that is, for, but putting on those ingredients, those, those nice organic uh, material, that's fertilizer. We should not be putting on other um, boxed fertilizers at this time of year. There may be some, there may be an exception or two that I'm not thinking of. But I would say, generally, we don't need a lot of fertilizers for most of the shrubs and trees. And of course, the people that make the fertilizers would like us to use it. And so there's, there's a, a prescription for how you should do that. But the reality is, I don't put any fertilizer on my maple trees or on my Berberus shrubs or on many of the other plants that are perennials around but I do give them some compost mm -hmm. and I do give, and I do put leaves around them in the winter. So that's a form of fertilizing that I, you know, I would really strongly recommend 
especially if, if for some reason you think it's important to put any fertilizer on, never put nitrogen on after the middle of September, I would say. Nitrogen because encourages. Nitrogen, it's really pushing growth, the green growth above the ground and you don't wanna do that in winter. That's, that's bad for the plant. Also, I, I wanted to say one other quick thing about fertilizer. We tend to over fertilize and fertilizers will wash through the soil and get into the groundwater mm -hmm. and leave too much of these active ingredients that are uh, adding more pollution than they are support for our gardens. So it's important to follow the instructions on the box and if anything, use a little less rather than a little more. That, that That's an will excellent be, point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's probably just about time to start wrapping up for today. Carol, was really? there any last message that you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, let me just, uh, because I did make a couple of notes of some things that I wanted to do. If you've got an irrigation system, it's time to get that irrigation mm -hmm. system blown out. And, and, and by all means, if you can get drip irrigation, it's so much better for saving water in the garden. Um, the other thing is with vegetables, as you let, if you're doing vegetable gardening and you've always taken out your kale and collards, don't leave them. Oh, and did I say this before? When you cut plants out of your garden because you feel you're done with them, leave the leaves in the, uh, leave the roots in the soil. Those roots will continue to give back to the soil. And by the spring, they'll be deteriorated. Mm -hmm. They've done all the good they're going to do, and you can put new plants in there. In fact, you could put, I put winter plants right in next to where I've taken summer plants out but left the roots in. Yeah. That's so those were the key answer. things. Yeah. Thank you. You're I feel welcome. like we could we could have a talk with you every day and keep learning. You yeah, so well, I feel like there was a lot more I could have said, but <laughs> that's always the case, isn't it? Thank you so much for joining us today. It's very generous of you to share your time and your talent with us. You're um, very welcome. If there are any questions we didn't get to, um, we'll be providing written responses to you on the discussion as soon as we can. You'll find more gardening tips, resources, and designs at growgreenguide.ca. And this is the conclusion of our 2020 Grow Green Live series. Um, we're closing up shop for the winter, uh, but you can keep checking for new information on the website. Thank you everyone who's tuned in. We will be back in spring of 2021 with more Grow Green Live segments. I hope that you will join us then. And thank you so much for joining us today.